the first lesson is taken from the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy, chapter 8, verses 1 through 10. Be careful to follow every command I am giving you today, so that you may live and increase and may enter and possess the land that the Lord promised on oath to your forefathers. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the desert these 40 years to humble you and to test you in order, that, in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your fathers had known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Your clothes did not wear out, and your feet did not swell during these forty years. Know then in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, so the Lord your God disciplines you. Observe the commands of the Lord your God, walking in his ways and revering him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land with streams and pools of water, with springs flowing in the valleys and hills, a land with wheat and barley, vines and fig trees, pomegranates, olive oil, and honey, a land where bread will not be scarce and you will lack nothing, a land where the rocks are iron and you can dig copper out of the hills. When you have eaten and are satisfied, praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. This is the word of our God. Lesson for this evening is taken from Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 4, beginning at verse 10. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I also know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. This is the word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel is recorded in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 17, beginning at verse 11. Very familiar account of Jesus healing the ten lepers. Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going to, into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, Go, show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, Were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, Rise and go, your faith has made you well. This is the gospel of the Lord. Grace, <clears throat> excuse me, grace and mercy and peace are yours from God our Heavenly Father through his Son and our Savior Jesus Christ. That was the love that has found us that we just sang in that last hymn. Our text is from the gospel lesson, Luke chapter 17, verses 11 through 19. It's a very familiar account of Jesus healing the uh, ten lepers of their leprosy. But in these verses, I think we can see something that is very uncommon and very rare, very extraordinary. And that's the extraordinary mercy that we see Jesus showing, which then led to extraordinary gratitude on the part of that one leper. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, who is our Lord and our Savior, there are certain things that you just don't see every day. You ever heard somebody say that? Now there's something you don't see every day. It's not just in pawn shops. It's not just out in the woods. People say that from time to time. Certain rare occasions, rare things, rare animals, rare items that you might see once in a while. If you have watched the news the last couple of days, you might be aware of the fight over a lion by the name of Mustafa. I think they named him after the Lion King movie. The reason that they're having a big fight over Mustafa is because he's a, a, a white lion, a very, very rare white lion. Not too many of them out in the wild, in the world. 
The other day I heard on the radio, a sports radio show, of, of a guy who sold his 75 or his rookie Michael Jordan b- basketball card to a dealer for the, the, the small price of $75,000 for a little piece of laminated cardboard. $75,000. Why? Because it's very, very rare to find something in that good of a condition. When I was Googling rare items in the world, <clears throat> I came across this. One of the rarest items in the world is a double eagle $20 gold piece. In fact, there's so, it's so rare that there's only one that is known to be in existence. It's going for, or it would go for, if it was sold over $7 million. That is how rare that $20 double eagle, both sides, gold piece is. All extraordinary things, extremely rare, extremely uncommon. And today, that's what we're going to see from the gospel lesson. Maybe not things that go for $75,000 or, 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 or $7 million, but something that has got a, a, a price of its own, that's priceless in our eyes. God's extreme mercy, God's extraordinary mercy, which then leads to extraordinary gratitude on the parts of those who have received that extraordinary mercy. Here's some context. Jesus is just starting his very last trip toward Jerusalem. He made the trip many times before as he was growing up, as he was in the first two years of his ministry. This is in his third year of his public ministry. He is less than two weeks away from going down to Jerusalem for the last time, where a crown of thorns would be made especially for him, pressed down into his skull, where they would take off his outer robe and they would expose his torso so that the Roman soldiers could make those stripes around his torso that the book of Isaiah talks about based on the whips around and around his torso where the nails were pounded into his flesh, his hands and his feet one last time the judgment of the world was waiting for him on that Good Friday. This was less than two weeks away from this account in our gospel lesson for this for this evening. He's on his way south, and, and as he nears the border of Samaria and Galilee, he approaches a, 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 a town where outside of the town there was a group of ten men. <clears throat> they, were, they were lepers, people who had leprosy. Now, leprosy is one of those things that the, 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 the world's... Re- Doctors and medical researchers have have all but eliminated or eradicated today because of the advances in medicine. But in Jesus' day, it was not uncommon. People got leprosy. As a matter of fact, in the Gospels, we're told a number of times where people were coming to Jesus to have their leprosy removed or healed from them. It's one of those diseases that it was very common in Jesus' day. In, in, in fact, that it was so bad that when, when you had leprosy, you, you were kind of relegated out of the society. You would have to live in what were called leper colonies that they, in, in that day. If someone would come near you that was clean, that was healthy, that did not have leprosy, they were required by law to call out leper. There's lepers over here. Don't come any closer. What would they do there? Absolutely nothing. What were they waiting for? Nothing but a slow, painful, excruciatingly painful death alone and away from their loved ones and their family and friends. Now now evidently, these ten men had heard about Jesus. So much so that when they heard that Jesus was coming and saw with their own eyes that he was approaching them, they called out to him. And and very simply, they said, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. We want you to please come near us and have pity on us. In other words, if there is anything in you, Jesus, that has pity, please heal us from this dreaded disease. Now, now, knowing the disciples the way that we do from the rest of the Gospels, what do you think the disciples were probably doing after? those lepers called out to Jesus. Remember when people were bringing their children to have Jesus come and touch them and bless them? Disciples wanted nothing to do with that because it was wasting Jesus' time. You think the disciples might have been doing something like that on this particular day? 
Or, or maybe Jesus, knowing the important mission that he was on, knowing that he was just two, less than two weeks away from suffering the punishment for the world's sins, he would have been wanting to get to Jerusalem. But no, ten men needed help, people needed mercy, and Jesus was going to stop for them. Extraordinary mercy. Jesus approached this particular leper colony, and he simply told them this. Go and show yourselves to the priests. The, the priests were the, the de facto doctors of the day who, who, who would be able to say you are clean or you are unclean. You are healthy or you are not healthy. You may rejoin society or you may go back to your leper colony because you are still infected with this dreaded disease. And that's what they did. They got out of that leper colony, and they were on their way to the priests. When all of a sudden, Jesus healed them. It, it was a miracle. Completely healed. All ten of them the same. He changed their lives forever. A brand new start, a brand new life. Talk about extraordinary mercy. On the part of Jesus, who looked at them and said, You need help, and I'm going to help you today. So, so how do we compare when we take a look at our lives of mercy and, and Jesus' life of mercy? Do we compare to Jesus' life of mercy? We may feel sorry. I don't doubt that any of us here feels sorry for people who are down on their luck. But what do we do to make it better for them? We might say, I'm going to bring some groceries to the food drive because I heard at church that we've got a food drive going for the, for the, the, the pantry in Kewaskam. But how many of us would find somebody who was in need and say, are you doing anything for Thanksgiving? Come on over to my house because we always have plenty of things to eat. How, how many of us would say, you know what, I'm going to be a mentor to you. I'm going to take you into my home and I'm going to provide a job for you. And I'm going to be with you until you establish yourself, until you kind of get off and out of that, that down on your, on your luck portion of your life. How many of us would do that? We, we might feel sorry for someone, but would we do something actually about it? That's extraordinary mercy. We might, as we often do, give money to an aid agency or a relief agency when there are forest fires or, or where there is a, a, a hurricane on the coast. How many of us would take the time to buy a ticket, take the money to buy a ticket and fly to California or fly down to Florida and say, you know something, I'm going to take some vacation time, my own vacation time, and I'm going to take along my checkbook and I'm going to see where there is needed help. And I'm going to do something for these particular people with my presence, with my help, with my work. That's extraordinary mercy. That's kind of close to what Jesus does and what Jesus shows us in his extraordinary mercy. And not just for those ten men, but Jesus' extraordinary mercy extends to the whole world. Whether you think that they deserve it or not, whether you think it's only for the good people in this life or not, re remember in, in less than two weeks from this day, Jesus was going to suffer the pain and the punishment that you and I deserve because of our sins, the hell that we deserve because of our sins. Why in the world would he do such a thing? Why would Jesus do what he was on his way to do? Why would he subject himself to the cruel mocking and the embarrassment and the whipping and the scourging and the beating and, and the cross for something that he never did. He didn't deserve that kind of punishment. Because we can be pretty ungrateful people, can't we? We deserve that because of our ingratitude and our ungratefulness. We, we, we know the blessings that God has given us. We, 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 we say them. We have been blessed. Not just physically, not just spiritually, but overall, we have been a very blessed people. And, and, and how do we respond? Every day, we still are frustrated or we complain about something. The air conditioner doesn't work. The heat works or too well. 
it's raining again. It's too cold. It's too warm. God does these things for us. God does everything for us, blesses us overwhelmingly, and we find still things to complain about in our lives. We, we might say thank you, Lord. We might sing thank you in our church services, especially on a, a national day of Thanksgiving that we have tonight and tomorrow. But for the most part, don't we very often take Jesus' love and God's blessings for granted? And then we have the gall to get upset when he doesn't bless us the way that we want him to bless us and when we want him to bless us. And in spite of all, it, of all that, Jesus continues to shower on us his mercy. Extraordinary mercy. Which then leads to an extraordinary kind of thankfulness or gratitude in our lives. After those ten lepers were healed and were off to the priest, they started to notice something. My skin is clearing up. And their joints did not hurt as much because those are some of the, the, the things that leprosy caused people. And they realized, you know something, we're healed completely healed and so they took off and, and maybe the nine of them went to the priest likely they probably went home one of them not nine of them but one of them came back fell on his knees and started to thank and praise jesus luke doesn't tell us all of the things that we would like to know but i would guess that those nine lepers would have been grateful they were probably very thankful that jesus had healed them that day but they were likely too caught up in the moment and in the excitement of the fact that they were healed to come back and say thank you to him, which often happens to us too, doesn't it? We see somebody who suffers a tragedy or a loss and we realize how blessed we are. And so we think, you know what, when I get home, I'm going to hug my wife or I'm going to hug my child or hug my husband and tell them that I am blessed to have them. But then what happens? <clears throat> Work gets in the way, and, 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 and life gets busy again, and we get home, and we totally forget about what we had planned on doing to show someone how blessed we are and to show them how thankful we are to them. Same thing with, with other scenarios in our life. When I get home, I'm going to tell my kids and show my kids how much I love them. But life gets in the way, and we forget about it. We, we, we sometimes come to church and we, we hear God's message of extraordinary mercy. And we are pointed to the cross over and over and over again. And we might feel very motivated to say, Lord, there's going to be some changes in my life. Because I know that my life has not been consistent with what you want my life to be. I'm going to start rearranging my priorities and rearranging my time and start living for you. And then life gets in the way again. And we might do it for a couple of Sundays. We, 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 we might even put a couple of extra dollars in the, in the offering plate because of some blessing that God has showed us. But a couple of hours later, a couple of weeks or months later, it's all forgotten. And we go back to our normal lives and nothing really changes long term. Look at the extraordinary gratitude that this one leper showed. He didn't even make it to the priest. He realized that he was healed. He turned around 180 degrees and he ran back to the source of his healing. He had to thank his Savior personally, face to face, mouth to mouth. He wanted everybody to know and to hear and to thank God and praise God the same way that he was going to do because he understood what God had done for him. Don't just settle for the easy thank you. In, in the no November newsletter, sometimes I, I just do the A line, B line, and, and, I, and I say, okay, a couple of paragraphs, thank God for something that starts with an A. So everybody says we're thankful for apples, and B, we're thankful for whatever starts with B that's good in your life, and D for dad, and, and, and F for food and family of thanksgiving, and, and, and down the line all the way to Z. And we're thankful for those things. Don't just settle for that kind of thankfulness. That's easy. 
show some extraordinary thankfulness. Show some extraordinary gratitude. Let it show in your life. Let it show in your church how often you come to church. Let it show in your home, in your school, and at your job. Let it show as you perform acts of extraordinary mercy to others <clears throat> like you have been shown. And, and if you need motivation for doing that, think of the cross, whether it's in your mind or on the altar. Think of the cross that's on the steeple whenever you go past the cross at night. And think of the extraordinary love that Jesus showed us. Every single minute of his life, every single second of his life was devoted to you and to me and to this whole world. And in that, he showed us extraordinary mercy. May that motivate us and move us to do the very same thing and show extraordinary gratitude to the giver of everything. Amen. The peace of God, which goes beyond our understanding, will guard and keep your hearts in the true faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.